the windup in his first offering. Just a bit outside. Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. Are you okay? Mm, I'm fine. I just uh, threw up in my mouth a little bit. Flutie takes the snap. He drops straight back. Has some time. Now he scrambles away from one hit. Looks. Uncorks a deep one for the end zone. Thalen is down there. Oh, he got it! He got it! He got it! Touchdown! 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 Touchdown, Boston College! He did it! He did it! Flutie did it! Well, I believe in the soul. The small of a woman's back. The hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, that the novels of Susan Sontag are self indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, softcore pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. Good night. Oh, my. Hi, once again, everybody. Welcome in. I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks for joining us here on The Sports Reporters on the Men in the Arena. Don't forget, you can catch every show live. See, I say this at the beginning every time to remind everybody. This is the promotional side of things. Don't forget, you can catch the show live on Facebook, YouTube, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch when the show is all done. You can then go to our YouTube site at welcometothearena.com. You can watch the show there forever if you'd like. And don't forget, every show within an hour or so right after the show is then uploaded to our podcast platforms, the most popular podcast platforms. You can find them all there. Just go ahead, search them out. You'll see all those graphics. If you're watching the show as we go through the show, and you'll find out exactly where to find us, and also at the end of the show as well. It is always a pleasure on a show like this where I get a chance to put together two excellent sports journalists, but also two great friends, if you will. And we will stay this time. Well, it's we're all in the state of Florida, but we have a lot to say about what goes on around the country as well. So all those of you who don't live in Florida... First, consider yourself lucky. That's another story altogether. And second of all, don't fear because there'll be a whole lot more. Uh, let us go ahead and welcome in the new kid, if you will, because I have known him for many years. I have followed his work. He is, without a doubt, one of the best sports writers I have ever come across and ever come to know. He is formerly of the Orlando Sentinel, where, quite frankly, they did everybody a disservice by basically what they're doing in media these days and putting this crap in the websites and on the newspapers instead of really good people. That's why I don't read or subscribe to the Orlando Sentinel anymore. Doesn't make a difference, though. He's still one of the best there is. He's a good friend, too. He's been covering sports a long time. It's a pleasure to welcome George Diaz into the man in the arena and the sports reporters. How are you doing, my friend? It's an honor to be in the arena with you, Ed, and uh, thank you for that uh, glowing introduction. And the check is in the mail. Oh, thank you very much. That's come on. But to those of us in broadcasting, that's all we want to hear, George. We just want to make sure that the check is in the mail at, at all times. Also joining George and I today is a friend of mine who you have seen on this show many times. He has been covering sports, high school, college sports in Florida for five decades. I'm not afraid to say it because he still looks like he's 17. Well, he actually takes he actually looks at sports like he is still 17 and 18, which is good. Because if you cover sports for a living, that's what you need. You need that little boy in you that is always there, and that's part of what he has. He is prolific when it comes to covering college sports, prep sports. Everybody in the state of Florida knows him. Big Blue, Larry Bluestein joins us on the show. Good to see you again, Big Blue. Good to be seen here again. Love this. Uh, love to get together with you, uh, as always. And great to see George. Uh, haven't seen him, but... Uh, uh, one hundred percent agree with you. One of the best journalists that we have, and uh, certainly has been or has proven it decade after decade. And a uh, lot to talk about uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, well, the nice and, thing between I mean, the you two know what? And, and I, I never have to fear telling the two of you to don't be politically correct. That's a great thing because Larry yes, has no yes, PC that, that is a barometer good in him whatsoever. And if you have read George's stuff, the man yep. no gone right right away the, the, the pc barometer is, is completely thrown away which makes it even better on the sports reporters gentlemen let's go ahead and start out because something that i i think will will hit a little bit on everything here today we are now deep into COVID 19 we are doing the show live on wednesday october 21st we have the nhl and nba seasons are done baseball is closing in on being finished very soon the nfl continues college football we'll get to all that but 
is it skill or luck, gentlemen, skill or luck, that all of these sports have managed to continue on at a level that they're at right now without any major COVID-19 disasters? And that goes for all the sports. George, you're the new guy, so I'm going to throw it to you at the first uh, at the first shot here. Is it skill or luck? Did they get it all right and fool all of us, or were they just lucky to get by? Well, I think we're uh, getting ahead of the story here, Ed, because I certainly think college football and the NFL are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. It would not surprise me at all if you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, stick the, the, the hole in this, the finger in this dike, finger in the other dike. Just now uh, saw that a couple of uh, Carolina Panthers have tested positive. Um, so that could be an issue impacting that game. So I think that at sooner or later, all the dominoes are going to fall perhaps in the wrong direction for the league. They've already talked about half staging the, the Super Bowl as late as March. So I think that definitely we will see more disruptive forces in play, not just in, in the, the NFL, but obviously in, in, in college football as well. And we've seen that right here in the state of Florida with the Gators. Okay, but is it not fair to say, though, that here we are sitting – almost up November the 1st, and you're right. We, we haven't reached the end yet, and uh -huh. we've had the Patriots, the Panthers, the Titans, different teams have all come up. Colleges have come up turning positive for COVID-19, but we haven't had any lingering deaths. We haven't had anybody really get sick to the point that they had to be hospitalized here. So it would seem that the NFL and these other places, George, can say, come on, guys, you guys overreacted the whole time. We're doing everything we can here, and we haven't had anybody get really sick yet well it's the really sick thing i mean let's face it i mean the, the the vast majority the overwhelming majority of people who have covid uh survive that still doesn't uh you still have to mourn the deaths of over two hundred thousand people in the united states so there is that ed and 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 the the obvious uh, uh dynamic here is that these are mostly healthy younger men who aren't uh, who aren't going to go down uh, easily but uh, I think, yes, it, it is a testament to the NFL that they've been, and college football, that they're able to keep these games in play. I just think that it's going to be, to say it's going to be a challenge would be an understatement, because I think that these scenarios will keep popping up. And I'm not trying to be Mr. Doomsday, but I do see a scenario where it's just going to be a little, a bit overwhelming, not because of deaths or anything that, you know, heaven forbid, somebody has some serious ramifications. It's from a logistical standpoint of trying to stage these games in a timely manner. We've already seen Tuesday night football. So th those kind of situations, they if they keep cropping up, and eventually it'll bite everybody in the ass. I'm going to get to the whole legitimacy question in just a little bit here. But Larry, let me bring you in specifically from the college and the high school perspective as well. You and I have done a, a number of shows here in the last couple of months, and we have decried the fact that California, Florida, Texas, specifically Florida, because that's where we are, is just letting a lot of the kids play, letting them out there. But we really haven't seen the overwhelming sickness that a lot of people said was going to happen. So from that perspective, I throw it now to you. Were they just right in what they've done? Have they done it correctly in getting these kids out there? Or are they just damn lucky that they haven't been hit yet? Well, uh, you know, you brought up before I answered that, you brought up, uh, you know, all the leagues. Obviously, it took Major League Baseball um, trial and error with a couple of teams like the Cardinals and the Marlins uh, losing all those games uh, because of COVID. And you got to remember, the Marlins played with a double A, triple A team for 18 days. So that kind of altered that in baseball, hockey and NBA, you were in the bubble. So actually, it does fall back on football, uh, probably, if not one of the most contact sports, the most contact sport, uh, where you don't uh, do any, uh, there is no bubble. Uh, but what has happened in, to answer your question, there are a lot of starts and stops, just like I told you. Okay, maybe Bluntstown didn't have 24 kids, but they had two, which was enough to shut down the program for 14 days and their opponent for 14 days. Uh, it's happened 59 times since the start of uh, football in the state of Florida. And then you read all about, <clears throat> excuse me, all the other places that have started and that have, have had to stop 
Midwest, Ohio, same thing, uh, South Carolina. So what happened was when Illinois, Nevada, California, parts of Texas, Virginia came together and said, hey, listen, I got a good idea. I'm going to make the decision. We're all playing on January 1st. See, now, if you would have done that in Florida, you may have had um, – you may have still had some cases here and there, but what you would have had is unity. And we talked about that because half the uh, 80% of the, the, the team, especially because I count it from Dade Broward and Palm Beach County in the South end, won't even get a pl chance to play for a state title, which is not fair. So in essence, um, it, it, the prediction of, you know, let's go out and play has been okay because anybody could have made that in, all the way back in August if you want. Well, but that it's just really it? tough for a kid. To... Just said here, does that make the high school season yeah. in Florida legit? I mean, and that's part of the big question I'm going to hit here because if you don't have everybody playing, not, how not can you to... say that a state champion is really a state champion? Exactly. Well, you can't, especially because a defending state champion like Christopher Columbus in Miami at 8A and Booker T. Washington at 4A, opted not to play in the state championship series. So to me, that's already a tainted deal because both of those teams have already proven uh, you're in the teams that have opted in, especially in South Florida. Now, this is where you really get, you know, it gets crazy because your powerhouse central Miami Northwestern, both of them defending state champions, Northwestern three time defending state champions and the private schools. Well, let's, let's concentrate on those two, which are six a and five a, they get to play three games, three whole games before the playoffs start. So to me, and, and, and one of them is Miami Central Northwestern is against each other this week to open up Miami-Dade County. Probably the most prospect-rich game in the nation uh, being played on a Friday night with 20% fans. But my point is, is they're starting and in, in, in the calendar looks like it's ready to flip to November. And it will in two weeks, less than two weeks. So that's what I'm saying. Why is it fair that these teams have to play, you know, these teams playing for a championship only get to play three games, then the playoffs. If you lose in the first round of the playoffs, you got to kind of, you could still play again, but you have to go seek your own opponent. It's been a, it's been a miserable year. It's not a good look for the FHSA down here, uh, governing body. It hasn't been all year and it, it, it'll never, never be as long as you leave uh, the, the, the top dogs out, out of the conversation. But on a college level, like you guys were saying before, you know, there's a little easier way to do things. You know, I mean, uh, you, sure, you're still going to be susceptible to, to catching COVID, but they run in a bubble format without being in a bubble. A lot of them take their classes, you know, online. Uh, they don't hit the campus truly till basically it thins out, you know, especially college, a lot of colleges now. That's what's going to happen in the Big Ten. Uh, they're going to, well, a lot of those on, are going to start before practice. Before you get there, before you get Go there, ahead. because I want to, I want to hear, you've got, you've, yeah. Beautiful the way you run this. I mean, you can tell we've all done this for a while. We all know how to segue into the next thing here that's really important, and that's where I want to get. And let me bring George back in here right. on the college football side of things because what Larry talked about is very true. The high school season isn't really legitimate because everybody is not playing and the teams yeah. are not playing. The schedule is not the same. The competition is not the same. You've had to change everything because of COVID-19. Now we get to college football on a national level where we again have teams that aren't playing that are national championship caliber teams and also rosters change because of illnesses due to COVID-19. So as we look at this 2020 season, George, is this season legitimate to me? And I've said this on a lot of other shows. This is an asterisk season, no matter how you look at it. Uh, you stole that word asterisk. That's exactly what I was going to say, Ed. There are, there's just too many hidden variables. We've seen some already. I mean, the Big Ten is just starting this week. Uh, shortened schedules for, for all of these other conferences. It's, it, it's, it, they're just, they're managing and they're doing a very good job managing under very difficult conditions. But it's this unknown factor that they wade into every single week and every sport from high school all the way to the NFL is in that same kind of scenario where where people are just trying to figure things out on the fly, Ed. And uh, when it comes to, to college football, yeah, there's a big asterisk. We just don't see that the scope of, of here is my report card. You know, here's our, you know, we're in school, right? So, so it's an incomplete report card if you're not playing a full schedule. 
And uh, certainly it will be an incomplete report card if, if games are impacted down the road and, and things have to get not only shifted, but perhaps cancellations. I wonder what happens if we get to the bowl season and you have teams that start popping positive tests, whether you get bowl games canceled. You, there's just so many variables that we don't know about. But I think that logic tells you where this is going. Let me play devil's advocate here. And George, mm-hmm. I'll get you on this. And Larry, I want you on this right after him here. But George, I'll stick with you here for a second. The athletic directors, the coaches, the players, the apologists, the people involved at the management level who will say to you and say to me, guys, look, we play the games, whatever they are. We don't schedule them. We don't know who they are. We go out, we play the games, whoever we get, whoever we get. So you guys are just making noise here because if for whatever reason these teams weren't here, we'd be playing anyway. That's got to be the lamest excuse I've ever heard that they throw at us, George, but that's the one I hear from a lot of colleges and a lot of college representatives. We play them as they come. You guys just need to shut up and let us play the games. Games are more important. Yeah, well, how did that work for uh, Mr. Mullen and the Gators? You know, he wanted 90,000 people at uh, at Florida Field. Um, I don't think we're going to get 90,000 people at Florida Field anytime soon, uh, much less the complete football team at the moment. So you just can't, you have to take this stuff seriously and uh, you can't be flip about it. So so here we are, Ed. I think, as I said, they are doing a very good job of managing a very difficult situation. But no, this is a completely doing things on the fly because you really don't know what's going to come tomorrow. And the Gators, again, are a perfect example of that. And the Gators will not be alone in having issues down the road because it is the nature of the beast. On to, just on a aside here, would you have disciplined Dan Mullen? I mean, I as the president of the university, I sure as hell would, or at least I would have placed a thumb on him and said, will you just shut up, please, for crying out loud? I got enough problems without you. Yeah, but the governor probably would have pardoned him, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, sure. We got political. We got okay. political. Wait First political stuff. Politics board, Diaz won, everybody else nothing on the day so far. <laughs> it's a good thing. But Larry, George makes the good point here because there are those who are going to say, we do it anyway, but it's it still to me comes out as that season where no matter who wins a championship this year, we didn't play either everybody we were supposed to play or right. we didn't have all our players or they didn't have all their players. So it still comes down as a... I don't want to say a tainted championship. Okay, no, I'll, I'll say it. A tainted championship, and it's simply got Mother Nature written all over it. Maybe it's an altered championship. Maybe okay, not tainted. Uh, it, it was all it was altered by all the occurrences that happened, and and certainly George George is one hundred percent. There's nothing that he said was wrong. I mean, it's one hundred percent right on. The only thing is, uh, when you take a look at all these schools. It, it's because the Big Ten has jumped into this late. It's because the uh, Pac-12 has jumped into to this late that how can it be a regular season? Most of these schools have been playing. There's there's what what uh, schools started, I think, in late August. They had a game on in late August. So yep. here you are. By the, by the time they kick it off in the Pac-12, it'll be on the eve of November 1st, which, <laughs> I mean, usually you're seven, eight games into the season by then. So, yeah, certainly it's going to be – you're going to talk about – well, we're going to talk about 2020 for a lot of reasons. Now that we have touched on college football, I just thought it would be interesting to, to just for, – for giggles before we move on to the National Football League, who's the best college football team in Florida right now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say the Gators until uh, Texas A&M uh, put the big whooping on them there. Oh, wow. That's a good question. Come uh, on, because you and I both know there's people out there who are screaming on this right now. They're they're looking at the Gators. They're looking at UCF. They're looking at USF. They're, you know, the, the Canes are saying that we're back right now. So the Canes have looked pretty good. There's no Certainly state that right, argues yeah. about it more than Florida. Yeah. But, uh, you know, here in our uh, backyard, you, you've had UCF just take a couple of just horrific losses and not that I thought that they were national championship or state of Florida contenders, but you know, they like to talk a lot of trash. And when you talk a lot of trash and you don't back it up, it comes back to bite you, you know, where, and that's where they're at. And uh, Florida certainly is going to have some defensive issues to work through if they 
uh, intend to make a, a significant run here down the road. I thought that they were good to go, and we saw what happened against uh, Texas A&M. Is it fair to say that we're not going to see Florida State be a contender for a long time? I mean, if, if there's a program that used to be a championship program in the state of Florida, Florida State looks putrid right now in, in so many ways. Yeah, and, and they have for a while, and let, let, they've had some – very questionable uh, leadership uh, coaching decisions that they've made, hires that have gone bad. Um, you had one of these deals where when, you know, the, the icon, you know, you had Bobby Bowden, obviously he had uh, his struggle at the end. Then Jimbo Fisher had some success, but uh, down the line, the last few years of Jimbo and um, the successors have just been, it's just been putrid. Um, and, I don't know, Ed. I, I, you would think, you know, we've always talked about it, and, and Larry, when he comes back on, is, is a much better voice for the state of Florida and the, and the fertile recruiting ground that it is. But um, for the love of God, you think that they'd be able to, to, to restock like most programs have done throughout the years in, in Florida because you've seen some slips at, at Miami. You saw some slips with, with Florida, but you certainly haven't seen this continued decline that we've seen over in Tallahassee, which is embarrassing. It almost seems as if people don't want to go. Kids don't want to go to Tallahassee anymore, that they're looking more at the UCFs and the USFs more than anything else. And that for whatever reason, when Bobby Bowden left, look, and we're talking about ages now, yeah. for whatever reason, they just don't see Florida State as a legitimate place to play football and win a championship, which is scary to me. I, I never thought I'd say that. Yeah. Well, and, and kids, look, we're in the age where kids like, you know, love eyeballs on them. I mean, who doesn't? So you've got a program that's struggling. They're not going to have a lot of primetime games. They're not going to have a lot of this national attention that's uh, bestowed upon them. So kids are just going to say, you know, they're not, they're not cool anymore. You know, they're like, you know, FSU is kind of like the cassette deck or the 8-track these days when everybody else is downloading uh, music. If to use that comparison, so um, they've got a ways to go. I don't, I don't know. Other than like you said, they've got to get talent there. There's no other fix. You can get a great coach in there. If you don't have the talent to compete, you're still going to go six and five or, or whatever you know, whatever those dynamics are. There's and if people who are watching from outside of the state of Florida, trust me, there is no state in the union that argues as much about its football than Florida. None period. End of story. All right. As we wait for Larry to join us, and again, we're sorry about the technical difficulties because that's the way things happen here in the in the new world. We'll go ahead and move on here. We talked about the legitimacy of college football, but then again, let's talk about the legitimacy of the National Football League because here again is a major sports league where players are missing, games are being moved around, schedules are changed, and to me, every time you have a non-entity in a player that's not there, like a Cam Newton with New England, for instance, you're not dealing with the same level of competition that the season is based on and that the team is based on. So to me, that's an incomplete. That's an incomplete for the franchise. That's an incomplete for the game. That's an incomplete for the season and the league itself. So is it fair to say that the NFL season is legitimate with all these, or illegitimate even with all these COVID-19 blips? That's yours, George. So I'm, am I back? Yep. Yeah, back. I think if the, NFL, if the NFL manages to wade through these choppy waters and finish out the season, you know what? Hats off to them. I say it's still a legitimate season. You're going to have some issues. You, know, you, treat, you treat COVID, you have a situation where Cam, he just misses the game. Obviously, Brian Hoyer is not the answer there. And that was a disaster. But these things do happen. We have talked about sports that are legitimate or illegitimate. We've talked about college football. We've talked about high school football. Is it fair to say that the National Football League, and Larry, I'll throw this to you first, that with all of the interruptions and all of the players that have been out, all the games that have been changed, all the cancellations that have gone on back and forth, that this is not a legitimate season? I hate to use that word asterisk, but here it is again, that this is not a standard or a this is an alternate season where, simply put, the competition level is not what it should be, and it's not what you can judge a real NFL season against. 
Well, yeah, I guess you can make that that uh, comment because it's it's valid in you know in the premise of what you're saying. But you know, there's going to be a lot of programs that say, hey, you know, we have all our guys; they haven't been sick. We've done this and that, but that isn't that a minor thing right now? Because then we start the year with 75 players who opted out and some pretty good ones if you look on new england's roster and uh you know a couple of others that you know yeah so it, it's an altered season i'll always i'll have to say it's been altered it's not something tainted because that that gives it a you know well, a bad deal and tainted. That means, i mean i i and i get yeah. that because i think that's but i think it's altered here, where a lot of people are angry at me for using this and they're saying you're you're, you're getting to that it's a tainted season it's not tainted, but it's a different season. Modified. You measure this Modified, season against maybe. all the other seasons that have gone by. Sure. It is not the same competitive season. You can't say that when you have starting quarterbacks, starting offensive linemen, running backs that are gone, starting defensive tackles and secondaries that are gone, players opt out. It's not the teams that the players began that the that the teams began with. So how can you really say that it's a competitive year? If it was injuries now, if it was injuries, I, I could say, okay, we're we're we're, we're going to get to that. That yeah, it it could be because of injuries, and you could say that things are different. But if Mother right. Nature gets involved here, it's not the same. Yeah, no, I understand. I just I would side on the fact that the the guys that are playing are playing hard. There's no doubt about it. You know, I've watched and I and I watch the games. Um, you know, they're competitive. Uh, you know, sure, there's a lot missing. Uh, you know, I. I think that the, um, you know, the very fact that we don't have a, the fans, uh, you know, takes away that team element, uh, you know, of the game. Because you even hear a lot of the uh, the players who are there, they go, oh, I just wish there were some fans here. You know, I mean, because obviously, you know, it sounds trite to us, but it's something that a lot of them feed off of. You know, there's on, a lot yeah. of yeah. So, you know, obviously that element has been taken out of it. And I'm sure George uh, agrees that the fact that, you know, you, you, you know, you could probably say that it's been an altered season and that's what we're always going to look back at it because you can't say, you know, anything, you know, uh, against the players because the players who are playing, I mean, I've watched, everyone's given a billion percent. Nobody's sure. like, you know, going well, halfway, will. you know, that. Yeah. The, the well, will, will and it, but I send a thousand percent, whatever you want to call it at all times. But right. when I see a New England team, and again, it's not that this has nothing to do with being a fan or not being a fan of the Patriots. I don't care. But when I see a Patriots right. team that gets throttled because their starting quarterback is out, and granted, Cam Newton is not the be-all, end-all to begin with. He's got his own problems. But when I see that happening, it's not because of an injury. It's because of Mother Nature. That changes everything. Yeah. And that's also, let, let's get to another point here. And George, I want to bring you in on this, that the players themselves are not even that real smart about it because – Cam Newton turns up sick and other players turn up sick. And then we learn later that Cam Newton basically had kind of snuck out a little bit and went on his own. So a lot of these players didn't even take it seriously. So how do we still then measure it as a legitimate, actual, real, honest season? Well, you don't. I think you measure it. I, I, I do give them credit. They are doing the best they can under very trying and difficult circumstances. And you're right. It, even, uh, Players are doing things you can't put all these guys in a bubble. So they're doing some. Some of them, there's always going to be a few in the in the pod, Ed, that are going to go off the rails and do something stupid. But um, something, ESPN had a really good segment on the fact that, you know, you used to, at the end of the game, you used to hug it out and trade jerseys. Now they can't do that. And they found a way to do it. They just, they, they wash them and they have them signed. And you send it to, you know, Christian McCaffrey sends it to Lamar Jackson or whatever the case may be. But, um, you know, they, they are, everybody is having to adapt. I give them credit, even though, yes, there will be an asterisk. Some people will say it was a COVID season. I give them credit at the NFL and players and everybody else involved uh, on down the line for trying, salvaging a season under very trying circumstances. And I will give them that. For the player's standpoint, the most of them, I, I would say, mm -hmm. have that, we are going to do the right thing. I still go back to the argument that I say that the National Hockey League did it better than anybody because, quite frankly, you had one player who left the bubble and he left it voluntarily, took a rask when he had to take care of his family. But guess what? They got through the playoffs and through a brilliant Stanley Cup final. It just yeah. the, right, the two right teams were there. And nobody left, nobody bitched, nobody whined. But that's another story for another day because, frankly, I think hockey players are – 
the best when it comes to caring about team first and individual second, but we can go on and on about that. We'll the NBA did a pretty good job here, by the way. Very good in job. Very the NBA, good job. The, the NBA did a good job, but they still had their knuckleheads. Yeah, but, but still, it was, it was, it, it, no they have a lot knuckleheads. more knuckleheads to contend with. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> actually you probably I, have I, fewer knuckleheads to contend I, with if you look. No, at I don't know. Well, you got a lot of egos to contend with. I'll tell you what. Oh, I'm you know, give you let, that. Let's See, let's but, take the let's take the NBA and the NHL salaries and put them uh, side by side, and I'm sure you'll you'll find a lot of guys in the NBA that are, right. are are sir. Are, are certainly, uh, you know, a little bit more privileged than others. But and I think your, that's your why point I like there is well taken. It, but your point there is well taken because the NBA players, these guys are making a tremendous amount of money. The egos are huge. They basically feel, look, you always have one player on a team that runs the franchise more than anybody else. Thank you yeah. the Miami Heat or the model franchise because they've gone past that thanks to Pat Riley being in charge. But you don't have that on a National Hockey League team. These are guys no. who are set in line. These are guys who do what they have to do. I think there's more of a team factor in the NHL than there is in the NBA. In the NBA, to me, right. it's still a group of individuals who gather on the floor. In the National Hockey League, it's a group of players who gather on the ice and act as a team. That's just me, and I'm, I'm, I'm a huge And plus, the NHL, the NHL didn't have range on Rondo's brother. Uh, you know, getting yeah. into something yeah. Yeah. whatever talking That's right. arguing with other people. You know, there was that X factor. There's always the X factor in the NBA. I, I will ab yeah. I'm absolutely going to give you that. Let's move on to Major League Baseball because as we sit here doing this show live on Wednesday, October 21st, the LA Dodgers have taken a one nothing lead over the Tampa Bay Rays mm -hmm. in the World Series. The Tampa Bay Rays are players that even the people who live in Tampa St. Pete have no idea who these guys are. I mean, you, you, you go to most of the don't go to the game. I, well, <laughs> even when pre-COVID, pre -COVID, they weren't going to the games, Ed. Peter no. Gollenbach is a New York Times bestselling author. We all know who, is, who he is. He's written over 40 sports books. He's a great friend of mine. And Peter lives in the Tampa St. Pete area. He's a huge fan of the Rays, loves baseball. And even he admitted to me, he said, we don't know the names of these players. They come and go. Most people can't even name them. And a lot of them are barely hitting their weight. In the postseason, they're hitting 160, 175, 180. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're not that good. But they got there, and they yeah, beat the yeah, Yankees. And here's the Dodgers now. And we, we look at this. To me, I think this talks about how the National League is simply put a stronger league right now and is a better league. I think the American League and the Yankees are sliding right now. They're having problems. The Red Sox are gone. The Rays are doing it with a cheap bunch of players. God love them. God love them. You know, really, I wouldn't mind seeing them win because they're doing it on the cheap. But I think the American League is basically showing how weak they really are. Larry, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, and first of all, you're if you want to look at teams for the future, the Braves are going to be there for a while. I mean, what they have right now sure. is just kind of a, a sample size of what they have. They've, they've done extremely well. I think another team that you're going to watch, another National League team, the Reds. I think they may be one or two players away. They've turned Louis Castillo into an ace. They have tremendous, uh, you know, Bieber, all these guys that have, uh, that have come through for them. And then I'll tell you what, you know, you talk about uh, a, a program that, you you know, and, and I and I hate to admit it, but um, if you lose long enough, you start getting good players. And, and the Marlins really benefited, uh, definitely benefited in these trades because here's Ozuna, who was traded for San, for the kid Al, 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 Alcantara, and Alcantara is still going to be a mainstay for years to come. And here's Ozuna has been traded around to where he, he's with the Braves. Same thing, you know, the Yelich deal. Uh, maybe the, the you know, it was tough to, to lose the Yelich. But you know what? To me, I think what they're doing with the fans at the World Series and the playoffs, they could have been doing all along. Heck, if the Marlins were told that they could get 13,000 a, a game, they would be elated. So, you Even know, the Marlins I mean, would jump to, up and down and scream and they'd have a party yeah. for crying out loud if they could get Yeah, oh, man, I'm yeah. telling you. That's why – that's why when the Hurricanes, it's it's the strangest thing you've ever seen in your life. But you have they're they're giving thirty, what is it, a fifteen thousand a seat uh, limit per game. They haven't come within eight thousand seats of filling that thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the UAB Harry game Bluestein, had six thousand gentlemen hammering away at those University of Miami Hurricanes. Everybody always screams at me because I do it. Now you're doing it. I'm glad. I'm not going to take the it, heat on this. It, one. <laughs> Ed, is that not a fact? Am I am not is not factual that Miami just doesn't draw very well? It I mean, is. if every fan, 
if, if every fan wanted to be a fan because of their national championship, you have a billion fans, but no one wants to identify with But you and I both know that the University of Miami who great fans. Is still living on 30 years ago. You're not that good. You're an average team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got Ed I got Ed rolling now. Yeah, this is his <laughs> this is his hot, this is your hot spot right here. George, this is this sweet is swing here because he knows that this is a hot button <laughs> for me because I love I, look, I used to call games for the University of Miami. I have a lot of friends down there. I love the program. But they have to stop living in the past here. You're you're an average team right now. They're really They're not going to. Anybody. They're not going to. Well, look, I want them. No, to be, come on, George. You and I both know this. Get, get in on this. The University of Miami has to get better again because Florida State's got to get better. UM's got to get better. That's what makes Florida great when it comes to college football. We're going to say flat out that the University of Miami has had terrible selections when it comes to various coaches that they've hired and they put in there. They put some guys in there that didn't belong there. They made a spitload of bad moves. But now, hopefully, they're going to get better. Okay. But at least stop living in the past. Right, George? Get better, but stop living in the past. Why are you, why are you hating on Willis McGahee? So oh, much, man? see, there you go. I knew it. The word hate would walk into this conversation. I'm not hating on anybody. <laughs> I was I was, I was, was agreeing with you. Growing up in Miami, Ed, you know? <laughs> It, you, you saw the deal. They would they would pack the you know FSU. They'd pack the stadium, and then when they played Boston College or somebody else, it'd be twenty thousand. And uh, sure. it, it is what it is. It's been that way forever. And those of us who grew up in Miami, the three of us, know what the deal is. And delusional. I mean, but delusional Hurricane fan is not much different than delusional FSU fan. Or, or delusional, delusional Gator fans, fans, or delusional any of the it, fans. It's yeah. just a, it's just a different topic. And for Miami, it's you know we're still our the uh, Gino Toretta, uh, uh, you know Jim Kelly back in the day, uh, Bernie Kosar. They're still reliving those glory days. And it's just uh, hey, all the power to you. Crank up Springsteen and uh, have at it. See, but here's the one thing <laughs> that gets, and I guess this is what annoys me about it. Everybody makes a big deal the last couple of seasons about the turnover chain. Will you stop? This is just ridiculous. Everybody's got to flash the turnover chain because they want something on the sideline. They want to be able to show it, put it around their neck, preen to the cameras. The cameras want to get a good cutaway shot near. Stop. To me, that's the wrong thing to do at this point. Focus on the damn football here and stop being a bunch of preeners who just want to go ahead and play to the camera. Play the damn football. I'm done. Well, Don't wait a minute, what about cables again. What about the uh, what about FSU and the uh, and the what is it the backpack was that the turnover backpack and people started making fun of them by making reference to Dora to the Explorer you know backpack backpack if you have kids you understand this so everybody gets busted on but you know these are these are ideas that need to be shelved much like New Coke back in the day uh, nothing to see here there you Let's go. Wow, he brings up new coke. That's the first time anybody's ever ever injected new coke into this into these conversations. We're, we're going old school, man. We're going old school. I had an eight track reference. <laughs> That's what you get for bringing in old people here. Get off, my, get off my lawn, Ed. You're annoying See, me. Okay, there it is. Yeah, here it is. The old guy here, Mr. Graybeard, telling me to get off the lawn here. I'm I'm going to stop that real right. quick. George, it's the toss up, and you get first on this. Something that's on your mind. Something that you want to throw in here. Something that's sticking in your craw. What is it? You know, nothing as much sticking in my craw as it is like, you know, this thing here. You know, we've got a man. <laughs> For those who are listening on podcast, <laughs> and he disappears perfectly on it, it's just yeah. as George puts on his mask. That Now, see, that to me, okay, show us your mask again. Let's see, because you got because you got the colorful mask, brother. It's uh, autism, actually, colors. A friend of mine gave it to me. So here's the deal, Ed. I'm not, I'm just making an observation. Uh, and this is a little hippie-esque, right? But we've lost the the human touch, the ability to connect with each other, the smile. I miss all of that, man. You know, I you know, I miss the ability to see a friend and hug it out. And uh, this is just it's not a rant, it's just kind of I just feel kind of bad about the whole circumstances. I, I hope that the day is soon come soon that we can all get back to normal. Shake hands, hug it out. (laughs) 
It's perfect on a live show because as soon as he nails it, guess what? Everybody's gone all over again. This has been, I got to tell you, and, and I have been doing television now. I've been doing television for about 30 years or more, and I have gone live on national networks and on regional networks before. This show has been more fun than any other show simply because of the technical screw-ups that are involved in here that has been absolutely part of it because unfortunately between George and it look it's not their fault it's our fault on this end we're quite frankly because the power went out we had to reset everything you don't need to hear the excuses because that that's that's not even where we're going with all this so because we got to this point I'm going to go ahead and we're all out of time Oh, wait a minute. Let's try this one more time. See, here comes here comes the surprise moment to see if we can actually get somebody back in. Woohoo! Here it is. Let's see if George can actually get back in it because now he is still masked. Ladies and gentlemen, George Diaz is still taking care of the mask. Nice job. There you go. I'm socially distancing myself from you. I just in case. I know you've been places where you where you shouldn't have been. Uh no, actually you didn't even yeah, you know, I mean I, I had my Bruins mask on, but you didn't say anything. Oh, okay. so. No, but like I said, I, I just hope we get to the point where we can all see each other, take these things off, and, you know, just say, hi, how you doing? Shake hands, hug it out. Let us get back to normal. Well, I hope you're ready for 2021, brother, because that's about the only time that that's going to happen. It, it's going to be a while. I hear you. Hey, George, thanks Good so much job, for joining yeah. us, my friend. Don't forget, uh, George Diaz, and let me go ahead and make sure that I, I get all this in here. If you want to get a hold of George on Twitter, it is at George Diaz. And on Facebook, it is at george.diaz.758. You want to find him there. Also, let me make sure, even though he's not here, I want to make sure that we give Larry Bluestein his plug because on the web, he's prepredzone.com, larrybluestein.com. And when it comes to Twitter, Larry owns the universe because he's got at Larry Bluestein, at SFHS Sports, at prepredzonefl. He, he runs things here. So that's we, we just got to get him in there and make sure that he gets his plug. George, thanks a lot, buddy. I'll talk to you again real soon. Keep up the good work, man. We'll have you on again. We'll do this again when everything is working. What a shock. All right. That sounds like a game plan, Ed. You take care. Be clean, brother. Take care of yourself. That'll do it for us. I want to thank Larry Bluestein. I want to thank George Diaz. I want to thank everybody for hanging in with us. It has been great. Don't worry. You can catch the entire show and laugh along with us at welcometothearena.com and all of the audio podcast platforms. Boy. When the software guys hear from me, it's going to be fun on this one. I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Until next time, take care, be safe, rock on. See ya. Be sure to stay connected on social media with questions, comments, conundrums, you name it. It's at Berliner Speaks on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. A great place to talk business and learn a lot more about what we do is simply... Check us out on LinkedIn. Just go there and search out Ed Berliner. A reminder that every single episode of The Man in the Arena is uploaded to YouTube. Just go to welcometothearena.com, or if you're on YouTube, search out Ed Berliner Media. If you would prefer to listen to The Man in the Arena, every episode is available for download on all the major audio podcast platforms. The Man in the Arena is produced by Entourage Management, LLC and Entourage Media. Entourage Media.